and thank you for joining the Cannes Film Festival Experience panel discussion in partnership with the American Pavilion. I am Dee Dee Rince Hughes with Fulton Film of Fulton County, Georgia, and it is my pleasure to serve as your moderator for this session. Joining me today with the American Pavilion is Michael Brimmer. Hi, Dee Dee. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Also, student advisor, Christopher Daniel. Hi there, glad to be here today. <laughs> glad to have you, Professor Daniel. Clark Atlanta University student, Deasia Mears. Hello everyone, happy to be here. And Spelman recent graduate, Sierra Franklin. Hi, thanks for having me, Dee Dee. Thank you all so very much for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedules. We're gonna hop right into this discussion. So explain to us what is the American Pavilion and how is it connected with the Cannes Film Festival? Sure, um, the American Pavilion is a hospitality and communications hub for Americans doing business at Cannes. And uh, in 1989, when we first started, it was more of a business center. Um, back then, there was no you know, digital technology and pocket computers called phones. Uh, so there were literally mailboxes where Roger Ebert and other critics could leave notes for each other. Um, we had some fax machines and some Xerox machines. Um, the British saw what we did and they opened up a venue down the beach from us that was more just about drinking beer at the end of the day. So we uh, took a page from that playbook and the following year we or, or opened up a, a cafe and a, and a bar at our space. And then the French got smart and they realized what a magnet the American Pavilion and the British Pavilion were. So they started leasing out chunks of the beach all along the bay there to all these other countries that wanted in. And this whole international village kind of grew up around us. So think of it like a, like a, like a shopping mall and the American Pavilion is the anchor store. It's the biggest pavilion. Um, it has evolved to become probably the go-to place for programming that you wouldn't find anywhere else in Cannes, panels and roundtables and parties and events like that. Um, we differ from the other pavilions in the international village in that all the others that have populated the space are basically state sponsored. So they're outposts for the governments of those countries to try to recruit more production business to those shores. And we don't have that political agenda here because the United States already produces cinema as one of its largest exports. Um, and um, But more importantly, the US doesn't have a ministry of culture to support what we do the way all these other countries do. So we're entirely funded by corporate sponsors and membership. We're the only pavilion that's member supported. Um, the first 15 or 16 years of our existence, we, we started this in 1989, um, this was completely paid for by Kodak. And then when Kodak went away, um, we had a couple of tough decisions to make because the student program kept growing in popularity, but it was very, very expensive to, to do this. Um, can even under normal circumstances is an expensive place to do business, but during the festival, the hotels and the restaurants, everybody kind of triples their prices. Um, so at that point was when we kind of split up the costs associated with mounting this event, uh, such that corporate sponsors would pay for the Wi-Fi and the hot and cold running water that we plumb out to the beach. Um, you know, the building of the space itself. What you see over my shoulder is actually the terrace behind our pavilion. Um, imagine a 4,000 square foot tent built on the beach with different sections inside, but the week before can and the week after can, it's just sand, there's nothing here. Um, and then the student program uh, ended up uh, funding itself through uh, program fees that the students pay uh, to cover their housing, their ground transportation, a few other things. Um, so that's how the American Pavilion kind of got started and evolved to where we are now. We're less about business services now and more about hospitality and communications. But uh, I'm happy to say that in the 10 years I've been here, we've had more students coming back and doing the program a second and a third time uh, than ever before, which tells me we're doing something right. We've made tweaks to the program every year based on feedback we get the prior year. Um, I'm an immigrant to the United States, and so one of the first things I noticed when I took this position 10 years ago was that um, there were a lot of Canadian students doing the program, and I, I said, well, if we're the American Pavilion and we're allowing Canadian students, why stop there? So the following year, we um, brought some fantastic students from uh, Hong Kong, a uh, professor that I know uh, from University of Notre Dame took a, a position at uh, University of Hong Kong and invited me to speak there, and the following year, I returned to Hong Kong and added Singapore. And, 
Um, over the years, we've had more and more international students, which I think also makes the program more robust, uh, makes the American students kind of step up their game a bit when they see what kind of global competition there is and also what kind of global opportunities there are to, to combine forces with other creative young people around the world. Um, and then after we sort of internationalized the program, my next mission was to make it more diverse. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy to say that over the last couple of years, um, we've, we've brought more students of color. Uh, it's funny, Professor Daniel, thanks to you, one of my first visits to Atlanta, I had a student come up to me after the presentation and said, I don't see myself in that video that you're showing. And I said, well, that's exactly why I'm here. Nice synopsis there. And uh, so Christopher, you served as the uh, student advisor. How did you get involved? I know Michael just mentioned that when he came to visit the campus, how did that connection um, happen? So definitely, thanks for your question, Didi. Um, roughly around 2018, 2019, I was still a professor at Clark Atlanta University. And part of my responsibility at the time was I was handling a lot of professional development activities and you know event coordination. So along with teaching my classes, I was responsible for bringing in corporations and bringing in other media partners and really producing experiential and interactive activities for the students. Because one of the things that you notice, especially here in Atlanta, we have a really robust tech entertainment pop culture scene here. So most of the students, when they enroll at Morehouse or Spelman or Clark, they want to go into the industry and they'll tell you that straight out. So a large part of what my job was, was to respond to that urge. And many of those students want to go into production and film and television. So that's like the number one concentration under their mass media arts department at CAU. So an email had gone out one particular afternoon and it was Michael's email. And it stopped at um, Charmaine Howington, who was the office assistant for the mass media arts department, she was just like, well, there's an email over here and this person wants to talk to you because they want to talk about the Cannes Film Festival. So immediately my light bulb just went off and said, okay, I'm going to respond to this immediately. So within two minutes, Michael had an email from me. And as it turned out, I was the only person within the Atlanta University Center that responded. So immediately we just came up with a whole idea to do an open house, just one random open house one afternoon. Great. Lo and behold, he Lo and behold, he shows up to campus. There's roughly over 100 students in this one classroom. And it was packed to capacity. And everyone was just really engaged. And he showed his real. He was just really taking questions. And you know, our students, they're really, really extroverted. And they're just like, so what do we need to do to make this work? And that was the same afternoon when one of my students who's at Disney now, Dejanae Callahan, she was the one that told Michael that she didn't see herself in this video. I remember specifically who it was because she's real, real small, real, real loud, but she's very extroverted, always really passionate. So he showed it. He had a nice sign up sheet and just a list went out and emails frequently went out. We did another virtual open house and that was a really good one. But then COVID happened the following year. We had actually like two students like ready to go, like fully ready to go, interviews passed, all this stuff. Wow. So they ended up doing a lot of virtual programming over the next two years. And our students, one, Michaela Washington, ended up just kind of sticking around and she interned with the pavilion and ended up like literally showing out. So she ended up getting like more than one internship throughout the course of the next two years. So then it kind of picked back up around 2021. Michael was just like, well, can we still do this? And so my whole thinking was, yes, let's definitely make this work because at the time, you know, virtual programming and like going hybrid for teaching, you know, students were a little discouraged and some of them just didn't know like what was possible. But at the same time, my background is in entertainment journalism. So I was literally like kicking up and just turning up every notch I could as a published writer. So that kind of led multiple film studios and other television networks and other record companies to just kind of stick by me. So students still managed to get jobs and internships and still managed to just kind of kick it up just because I was working as hard as I was working. So once we kind of got everything back up and moving, we got another virtual open house going. We had about 10 students show up. And DeAsia was one of those students, along with some other students from all of the schools. And by that time, we literally narrowed it down to about five students from the Atlanta University Center. It was um, three from Clark Atlanta, one from Spelman, and one from Morehouse. So that's kind of where I came back in. So he got those five. He was like, well, since we have five for the first time in our history, why don't we bring you along as well? And you come on as a you know student advisor. And what was cool about that was a record, to our knowledge, I'm the first black student advisor that the American Pavilion has had since 1989. So it was really cool to, you know, go to one of my 
destinations, you know, the French Riviera and Cannes. I'm a big mm-hmm. Prince Under the Cherry Moon fan. So it was all about me just going to kind of just check out the beach and check out some of the films, but really more so be a support system for all the black and brown students that were there. It was a wonderful 18 days. Um, we actually arrived a little bit early for training and for orientations, but, you know, lots of mansion parties and rooftop events and experiences and the long lines outside the theaters and a lot of celebrities walked by. And it was just really eye opening for the students to be able to see that. But to also, you know, like literally you're by the beach all day. So it's literally like no way that you're discouraged or feeling just off because you have the most beautiful water that you've ever seen. And, you know, you can go across the island to another island and just check out some stuff over there. But it was all in all probably one of the dopest experiences that I've ever had. And I know they've definitely enjoyed it as well. Absolutely. I'm sure. And you, I mean, I'm over here beaming as if I've gone because of your, the way you've just described this experience. So Sierra, Tell me your major and what you plan to do with the experience that you had at Khan. I was in the first class of documentary filmmaking majors at Spelman College. Mm -hmm. So we were sort of like guinea pigs in a lot of ways, but it left a lot of room for experimentation. I didn't know much about the story behind, you know, the history of us getting there. Mm -hmm. I just applied and, um, I think to Professor Daniel's point, there's a lot of things you don't know can happen. So for me, it wasn't necessarily about, you know, leveraging the experience, but just trying to take it all in and sort of be there Mm -hmm. and be present in the moment. Um, I will say what I did end up taking and learning was that the industry is so expansive and there are so many opportunities um no matter where you see yourself now Mm -hmm. you could go to this experience and and leave realizing there's so many things that you can do and so many ways your skills and talents can be utilized because i think a lot of us when we start in film we think i want to be a director i want to be a writer or an actor and then you don't realize there are so many aspects in this business. So for me, I think I was just more open to realizing there's space for all of us. And um, and really that this industry is welcoming to all of us. There's space really for all of us to come in and do what we do now, just in film. And what is your uh, career aspirations? So currently, I would like to be a producer on feature length films and television shows. Oh, really nice. So that opportunity for you was just an open door, just a way for you to to get to kickstart your career, basically. Yes, well, I think coming from the documentary film program, especially in Atlanta, um, a lot of my experience was independent. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was run and gun and really like get your get your work made. And even though I did work a lot on union sets here and so many opportunities are opening up. When I went there, I learned really why the film culture is the way it is, why people are so personable, why personal relationships are so important. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to these spaces and when you get the opportunity to be in those spaces, you realize that people wanna enjoy the people they work with, wanna have personal relationships, wanna be able to have a drink after work because we're on set all day. So um, that personal aspect of the industry, I really came to enjoy and appreciate more. Good. And DeAsia, same question for you. What is your, you're currently a student at Clark Atlanta University. Um, what is your major and what experience do you look to take? Um, what, what nuggets are you looking to take from the experience that you had? So currently I am a mass media arts major with a concentration in radio, TV, film. Um, with the experience that I had at Con, um, for the most part, I'm very introverted. So that was very, uh, like a really eye opening thing for me. Um, and I feel like I limited myself a lot when I was um, at school, I wasn't really trying to do much. Um, so I think that opportunity pushed me to want to do more. Um, and like, 
really network myself and really put myself out there and, you know, just like not feel like I'm not enough because like everybody started somewhere and networking gets you anywhere. And with that, I also realized what I wanted to do as a career. I don't want to limit myself. So I do want to do multiple things, but I do want to be a director of photography. So I think that really, really opened my eyes to a lot of opportunities out there. Both Deasia and, and Sierra, um, I think had a double challenge this year. Um, it was a it was a complicated year at Cannes. Um, without getting into a lot of details, there was a little bit of a COVID outbreak, and there's a trickle effect with that where your roommates are affected, the other students assigned to the internship that you're assigned to are affected, and there's contact tracing, and there's isolation, and there's trying to pull resources from among our student advisor group to be able to just run up meals to the students that are isolating. So I, I, I gotta just give you guys props for, for rolling with it all because it was a complicated year. Uh, in 2021, nobody got sick. And in 2022, the French lifted a lot of their uh, COVID protocols. There was no more mask mandate on the buses, which I thought was a mistake. Uh, there was no more maximum occupancy capacity in the cinemas, which I thought was a mistake. Uh, you know, the, the main theater where the big premieres are held is 2,300 seats and it's showing movies all day long and, and they were filled to capacity with no masks. Um, in 2021, that wasn't the case. They were only filled to 65 or 70 percent capacity and everybody was wearing masks. Plus, there were testing stations and you had to prove and show a negative COVID test result uh, that was no more than 48 hours old just to get into the festival zone. And all of that was done away with this year by the French. So we were kind of thrown those curveballs when we arrived. And um, even though I had a couple of COVID isolation apartments on reserve, just in case we needed them, I did not expect that we would fill them so quickly. So I really wanna applaud you guys for rolling with it because I know that you were all impacted, even if you didn't get sick and didn't have to isolate, you were impacted by other students on your team and, and roommates and friends. And it just created a, a, a level of anxiety, I think that we don't usually have to deal with. So thank you guys for your, your ability to roll with it this year. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sure that was, you know, on top of everything else, like you said, that was, uh, you know, a concern uh, to just try to make sure that everyone was safe. Um, so, Michael, also, can you tell us about the three distinct uh, programs that you have um, with film and business, hospitality and event management and um, your alumni pr program? Sure. Um, you know, we, we try to mix the group up. I think what, what you see in can that you may not think about until you're there is the intersectionality between um, entertainment and events. And that kind of trickles into journalism and marketing and PR and all these other aspects. Um, so what we do at the American Pavilion is, is, is first of all, we're, we're satisfying a requirement by the festival that our students aren't just brought over with, without a purpose. So every student that we bring has to be assigned a role to play. Um, we assign roughly half of our students to teams inside the American Pavilion, helping us run operations like videography and social media and, and programming. And uh, we've got hospitality and event management students that will mostly take care of our front of house operations like our restaurant and our bar and our coffee bar. And then the other half of the students opt to be assigned to companies that are doing business at the festival. And those could be their distribution companies at the film market, which is a major component of the festival is this independent film market where thousands of people are meeting and buying and selling film rights around the world um, or with PR firms or with talent agencies or with trade publications. So depending on the student's interests and what the students hope to come home with from the experience, we try to find a placement for them that makes sense. Um, what I love about that is that, you know, the, the first day I, I meet them all for the first time at orientation, you know, they're all kind of jet lagged and bright eyed and not, not knowing really the tsunami that's about to hit them. Um, but then two weeks later, they're all going home with 200 completely unique stories based on where they were placed and the people that they worked with. And I think that that's one of the real, uh, you know, values of this program is that is that you really do take home real world experience that you wouldn't get that quickly anywhere else. And I've heard it time and time again from from students. You know, I'm sure Deja and Ciara within a few years will say, you know, I went in for this interview or I went in for this meeting 
and they went halfway down my resume and they saw Cannes Film Festival and they asked, what's this all about? And the, the students that have told me this in the past say, you know, that that changes the power dynamic during the meeting where suddenly the student gets to sit up and talk about something that they did that most people haven't done. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this up front, but the Cannes Film Festival uh, is different from the Toronto Film Festival or Sundance or other festivals you may have heard of in that it's not open to the public. So the fact that we're able to get these uh, accreditations for our students based on our long history and our special relationship with the festival is huge because it means that the students are, first of all, taken more seriously when they're there and they meet new people because the new people know that that it's not open to the public. They, 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 they were invited to come to the festival. Um, and secondly, that the people that they're meeting are more, more accessible and more approachable. Um, you know, at Sundance, you could be standing in line for a movie and First of all, you can't tell who anybody is because everybody's all bundled up in their, you know, winter gear. Can is a lot more, it's easier to identify people and talk to them. But secondly, you know, the person in line in front of you and the person in line behind you could have nothing to do with the entertainment industry. So, um, you know, might be considered a waste of time to network with a real estate agent, for example, but it can, that's not really the case. You know, anybody that you're, that you meet anywhere, uh, they may not be filmmakers, but they may be involved in some other aspects of entertainment. They could be agents or publicists or managers or lawyers or financiers or journalists. You know, the list goes on and on. This is so good, you guys. I hope that you are all taking notes, writing down these different nuggets. And you know, after um, watching this discussion, doing your research to find out how you can get involved. Michael, I'm going to stay on you um, a little bit longer. Let's talk about our partnerships. You know, this year, Fulton Films served as your transportation sponsor for the students. And we are excited about expanding our contributions um, as the years go on. How important are partnerships with this organization and not with just us, with other companies to support this initiative? They're, they're huge. And I really, really appreciate you guys stepping forward with that because it was another curveball that was thrown at us. Um, usually the uh, housing complex where we stay has shuttle vans that go back and forth between uh, the bedroom community where we stay, which is only three kilometers away, and the festival. And this year they, they sprung it on us like a month before, two months before that they weren't gonna have shuttle vans. Now, the alternative is the city bus. And the city bus is easy to navigate. It's not, you know, it's a, a Euro 50 for each ride or I think 13 or 14 euros for a week unlimited pass. Um, but, you know, we've got to train the students where to top off their card at the tobacco, which is like the newsstands. Um, and, and I don't even know how it all came about, but when I found out there were no shuttles, I think I met you around that time and I said, help. You know, could could you could you sponsor the the bus passes? Nice. And we had never done that before, and it was great. It was a lifesaver because the students did, had one less thing to worry about. You know, when they arrive, we give them their student handbook and a, and a and a and a backpack. And guess what? There's a bus pass in it there, courtesy of Fulton Films. So thank you for that. Um, these these little partnerships may not seem like, you know, they're 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 earth, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Life changing but they add up and they make um, all these little bumps in the road a little bit smoother. Um, another example is within the tent on the beach that you see behind me, we used to always dedicate a section for a student lounge. And this year, Deadline Hollywood decided that they needed to do a um, media terrace uh, in our space and they wanted a green room for touching up the makeup of the celebrities that they wanted to interview for their, for their media terrace. And so they basically took over what was our student lounge. And, you know, I'm saying to our management, the students need a place to chill between screenings and between, you know, uh, their shifts. Um, what can we do about that? And we found a really sweet apartment just five minutes away, right outside the festival zone, right across the street from the beach that served as kind of a student lounge space. Uh, and thankfully, two other partnerships came forward to help us defray that cost because, again, nothing is cheap. So we had University of Central Florida and uh, Quinnipiac uh, chip in to help that uh, space come to life. Uh, it was the first time we'd done that, too. So there was, again, a learning curve with how to manage when it's open and when it's closed and who unlocks the door and how do we keep strangers from coming in and, you know, off the street because it wasn't it within the festival zone. We, we had this other security consideration. So, you know, each year there's a, 
a lot of these little curveballs that we have to figure out how to roll with. Um, uh, but these partnerships are, are crucial to us because, like I said, we get zero um, government assistance for for doing this. Uh, and and I'm thrilled to hear that Fulton County would like to uh, to expand on this relationship because I think there's always room. Oh, and by the way, one other thing I should say. Uh, the American Pavilion this year, after 32 years, 33 years of being independent, was acquired by Penske Media Corporation. Uh, PMC is a huge media conglomerate that owns, among many other brands, they own uh, Rolling Stone, uh, Women's Wear Daily, Art News, Sportico, Spy, Variety, IndieWire, Hollywood Reporter, um, um, Rob Report, a bunch of publications. And when they... Um, express interest in, in sort of saving us from going under during the pandemic, uh, my first question was what's in it for them? I couldn't quite figure out where we fit into that ecosystem. Right. And I quickly learned it's because they look at our students as, or our program rather, as a pipeline for talent for students. So one of the things they've asked me to do is expand my outreach to journalism schools around the country, uh, create a journalism track in concert with IndieWire, um, while we were in Cannes, I introduced Professor Daniel to uh, the gentleman at, um, at um, Deadline, who was overseeing this activation. Deadline's another PMC brand, uh, and he, you know, admitted as much that you know we need young talent always. Um, a lot of students who are interested in film but aren't necessarily filmmakers um, write reviews, share their thoughts. They've got accounts on Letterboxd. They've got followers, you know, five thousand followers, ten thousand followers. And it makes perfect sense for um, you know, a, a, a family of brands like PMC to nurture that talent and help, um, and, and, and help students get a sort of a foot in the industry. So to that end, one of the things PMC did this year, which thrilled me also, was they provided uh, five or six scholarships for uh, students with financial need. I think one of them was sponsored by Variety, one of them was sponsored by Hollywood Reporter, one of them was sponsored by Rolling Stone, et cetera. Uh, so we hope to build on that too. All of these kinds of partnerships are are needed to keep this going because you know it's it's um, <laughs> it's a lot of moving parts and it's a really ambitious undertaking to try to pull off uh, successfully every year in a two week period. Well, you mentioned scholarship opportunities. Are there scholarship opportunities for students who may um, cannot afford the to participate, or what are some of your suggestions in terms of uh, students? Um, raising you know, the, the capital to be able to uh, participate in this opportunity. Right, right. That's always been the part of my work that is the most frustrating because I don't want what we do to feel like something that only privileged students can do. And there are schools in this country with big cinema departments where the students don't have financial need and they come to Cannes and they don't really, I think, appreciate the access that they're being given uh, the, the connections that they're making. And then we have students that come from, you know, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and they, they work it and they come home with, you know, a stack of business cards and business opportunities and, uh, you know, students from schools that aren't, you know, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, uh, Grand Valley State in Michigan. These are, these are small schools that wouldn't ordinarily have this opportunity. And what I'm trying to do is break down the financial barrier to entry um, up until three years ago, um, I had no um, uh, benefactors uh, prepared to underwrite the cost of attending for students. And then on a trip to, I forget, um, University of Hawaii, I met somebody that's on the board of directors for the Colin Higgins Foundation. Colin Higgins was a famous uh, gay director in the 80s who did um, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas and Harold and Maude and Nine to Five and mm -hmm. Silver Streak. And, uh, and he uh, asked if we would be willing to accept contributions uh, to underwrite LGBTQ students. And I said, yes, of course. Uh, and so that was kind of the beginning of it. He, he, the Colin Higgins Foundation generously sponsored three students the first year, uh, then the pandemic hit, everything slowed down again. Uh, and then this year they weren't quite ready to come back. So that's when I was happy to announce that PMC stepped in. But if you don't, qualify for a scholarship because it is need-based and it's a very tricky proposition to try to you know see who is who, who has need and who doesn't and, and you know we can't ask people for their bank statements that's just not right so we have to 
trust that when somebody tells me, you know, I have $60,000 in student debt or whatever it is, that this is true. Um, but if they don't qualify, if for whatever reason, there's somebody that, that we feel is more deserving for the limited scholarships we have access to, um, then there are other creative ways of funding this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I always urge students to start with their school because most institutions now have initiatives like, you know, be world ready or, you know, these, these sort of initiatives to, to get out of where they are and travel internationally. Uh, and they often provide stipends for travel, $500, $1,000, something like that. Um, uh, different departments at universities, like uh, I had a, a student studying at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania who was minoring in philosophy. And he went to his philosophy department and they gave him $1,000 uh, toward his trip. Um, so there's a lot of stones you can turn over to try to look for money. Um, you know, worst case, you do crowdfunding. Um, we've had a lot of students that have raised funds that way. Uh, I think Michaela Washington um, somehow uh, did a GoFundMe that uh, was it Matthew Cherry picked up on it and retweeted it and suddenly she was able to raise her funds for, for the program. Um, um, you can also just Google study abroad grants. Uh, there are organizations, international organizations that will help subsidize student international experiences if you apply directly through them. Um, I know in one, one particular German company, two of our students uh, told me they had to write an essay and submit a, um, a budget that included not just the program fee for, our, our, for coming to Cannes, but also spending money and uh, you know uh, meals and airfare and other expenses. And in both cases, um, this German company paid 40% of that entire budget. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of creative ways to fund this, but I always say start with your school because you never That's know. Amazing. And also some schools offer school credit, academic credit for doing this program. So that's another way to kind of justify the expense if you're able to show that you know, you're actually getting three credits toward your, toward your major or whatever by doing these internships. Professor Daniel, can you um, weigh in a little bit on this? Are you familiar with any opportunities or endowments that the students um, at the AUC can possibly get involved in? Or is there yeah. something that could be, is that's being worked on currently? Uh, yes. So one, another one of my responsibilities was dealing with, you know, professional development. So I was always in talks with career services at Clark. And I, that was actually the very first meeting that I took when I took the job originally five years ago. And one of the things that I discovered over the last year was there are relocation fees and stipend money available for people who are with internships in other parts of the country or in other parts of the world. So that's definitely one particular thing that I think you just have to go ask and kind of figure out what the application process is, but there are definitely funds and resources for that. I'm currently at Morehouse College now helping to build out their journalism program that was developed last year. And I'm over the whole arts and culture track underneath the sports, culture, and social justice program. So still working to see kind of what resources are there. But I imagine they're probably dealing with some of the same processes. But I'm sure between career services at most of the institutions, there are definitely ways to sort of get them to come in and follow your wave, especially when we announced that we were going and that this was one of the first times that that many students were actually going to go. You wouldn't believe the amount of emails and DMs on Instagram that I got and still get to this day like most of the students that i you know was supporting and trying to really advise i still talk to them to this day and they still ask me questions about jobs and resumes and how to get on set or how to sort of pivot into other spaces and just really just general advice you and sierra had the opportunity to meet and greet with our chairman rob pitts um before yes. your departure what impact did that have on you to have the support from your local municipality? Well, as a writer, you know, I'm always constantly, you know, rubbing shoulders with everybody covering stuff for the city of Atlanta. So it was beautiful to sort of see me wear another hat, if, if you will, and just know that that communication between the universities and with the local municipality and to get that sort of support because we have so many students that literally come to this city because they want to be in our film culture. Mm -hmm. Like that's the one thing that you hear the first couple of days of class. I want to work at Tyler Perry Studios or because, you know, um, CAA has an office here. People want to be agents. So they want to figure out what agency they can get represented by or even the legal 
space because we have so many entertainment lawyers in the city and record companies. Everyone comes here because they physically want to be a part of this scene and really be the game changers in that scene. So to know that your office and Fulton Films really want to step behind us and really push and really let people know that Atlanta influences everything. Like one of the things that most people remember me by is I wore those t-shirts literally every single day. And I found even while I was there that there were members of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association that grew up in Druid Hills. Like what type of, yeah. And so once they found out that so many students from Atlanta were in the room, it's like, who are they? Where are they? We have to shake their hand. We have to meet them. We have to take photos. One of the marketing directors from Actors Express they were actually there with an, in an Airbnb. And once they found out that there were Clark Morehouse Spelman students, we actually are still having meetings right now about how to really get more support from the Actors Express and from the local theater community here, just because they really enjoy seeing these beautiful black and brown students out here networking and shaking hands and rubbing shoulders. And let me tell you, they got it from the first day they got off that plane. Everyone that was from our group, shaking hands, taking pictures, collecting. Like one of the students got to take photos of Faye Dunaway and she handpicked him to go and actually like do this particular session in one of the hotels. So they really made the world their oyster. They had a good time, they ate some wonderful food. And a lot of this happened because of you know, Rob Pitts' office and just your support and your enthusiasm. You know, we didn't expect to come down and do a live interview with you guys or to do any of this stuff. We just was happy that we got the opportunity to see something new and something fresh. But to know that the city of Atlanta and the schools are getting behind this and really want to see what more they can actually do to get more of us over there. And now that I'm at Morehouse and I have all these students over here between journalism and C-Temps, now it's time to get more of these guys over there because they follow my Instagram and they see what these other students are doing. And they're just like, so what else can we do to be a part of what you have going on? But it's beautiful to know that the city and your office is behind us. I'm hoping we can definitely build and do more with you guys because Absolutely. the talent is there, the drive is there, the ambition is there. We just have yes. to just get behind them, just show them yes. that we care. Yes. Yes, we absolutely, um, you know, would love to because we just wrapped up um, our partnership with the Morehouse Human Rights Film Festival. We were a part yes. of that. We were a sponsor. Um, and once again, looking for ways to, you know, our, expand um, our support throughout the community. And for you, Sierra, how was that experience? We sent you and your um your, your your colleagues your classmates off in Fulton film gear so how was that experience um meeting and greeting our chairman it was lovely meeting director Pitts um I was one of those students who definitely was scrounging my coins before leaving <laughs> like I remember I um I was gifted the the full cost of the tuition and the badge um as a graduation gift and had my um flight there actually covered by the VA after my um my tuition was finished but um I still didn't know how I was getting back home. So I was like five, six days away from leaving. And I was like, well, I guess I'm, I'm a resident in Cannes now because I don't, I don't know how I'm getting back. And wow. that, that sort of faith work that happens and just having the support of the city behind you means so much. It, it bolsters you all the way through. I, I remember even going to Professor Daniel and being like, I lost my phone. I, I'm having a rough week. And just knowing like people are at home supporting you, people are at home wanting you to do well and wanting you to enjoy yourself and succeed is so important because a lot of us are in this filmic journey, you know, pursuing our own passions by ourselves. So just having the city of Atlanta behind us, having the AUC behind us and knowing the whole team at um, the American Pavilion was there wanting us to succeed meant the world really. Deasia, what are your takeaways um, from this experience and what, is your advice for students who may be interested in taking part? Um, so my takeaway is really just to not limit yourself. Um, that's one of my big things, cause growing up, so I'm not from Atlanta, I'm actually from Philadelphia. And growing up in Philly, it's not a lot of like known media outlets or, you know, it's not a lot of people. Which is why I actually came to Atlanta. <laughs> As uh, Professor Daniels always say, you know, Atlanta influenced everything. Um, so with this, it really, it really pushed me, gave me that motivation that I really needed. Um, and also to have the support 
from like not even my city, but other cities. It, it really like gave me that that push I needed because sometimes I always feel like I'm not doing enough or, um, you know, I could do more or people like don't take me serious. But now like with this opportunity is it really opened my eyes to a lot of new possibilities. Um, after this program, I actually got a lot. I, I'm in a lot of things right now, uh, you know, networking wise, everything was great. So for future students, you know, I would just really recommend them to, you know, open open your mindset, uh, broaden your horizon, you know, don't don't set yourself on one thing because there's a lot of things out there that you can do and, you know, believe in yourself. That's the key because it's a lot of people believing in you. And if you don't believe in yourself, then what are you there for? What was your area of focus uh, during the festival? Who are you asking? DeAsia. Oh, sorry. I was on the videography team. Okay. And what about you, Sierra? So I was assigned to SAG Indie, which is um, a magazine, a journalistic publication, really, about how to produce your work without a huge company behind you. Um, I was interviewed by the founder of the pavilion and she kind of fell in love with my writing and um, she, she said she was really impressed because she was scouring it for um, for errors and she couldn't find one, which you know, wow. made me feel really good. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm a good writer, like, whoa. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was really writing heavy and it was a blessing because I went into the festival every day around 10, um, got to go there and put on very inspiring and educational panels with some of the industry's leading filmmakers doing everything from producing their own works to representing talent. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a blessing really because I was there on the beach in that background that um, Michael has right there every morning. And then after a couple of hours or after two panels and just absorbing as much information as possible, I got to go on and they let me loose and I got to see as many films as I wanted, went to panels, went to discussions, went to the beach, went to that um, that gorgeous um, student lounge. Thank you so much for that. Like that was my home base, home base right there. But um, I think you have a lot of freedom no matter what you're given, no matter where you're assigned because there's plenty of activities for the students. You can see as many films as possible before your shift or after and really absorb the film culture there. Mm, what an experience. So Michael, for students who are interested in participating, what are the next steps? How do they start to prepare now and how do they stay informed and connected? Now I will put a link to um, uh, our new application portal for students okay. that wanna get involved. Um, our, our website's a little wonky because it's got information in it that also is uh, aimed towards sponsors and members. But this link I put is the student program page. And that where, that's where you will see information about our CAN program, film and business, hospitality and events, and culinary, uh, as well as the uh, Emerging Filmmaker Showcase that we put on every year. Uh, and then a new program, it's actually not a new program. Uh, we have a program called LA Intensive that uh, we ran for about 17 years and we discontinued it about four years ago, but we're bringing it back next year. And it's a great you know, eight day program for um, seniors and recent grads who are contemplating moving to LA uh, and getting involved in the industry out here. Um, so that's gonna be on that page. But anyway, all of those pages, all of the pages on, our, uh, 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 all of the sections on our student programs on that page have a button that says apply here or apply now. Okay. And that will take you to the portal um, there's a $55 application fee. Uh, you enter your information, your school, your major. Um, once you select which program you're interested in, that will steer you toward a set of essay questions for that program. Okay. Um, the essays aren't complicated. You know, just write a paragraph for each question. Uh, and then you, the next step is you upload a copy of your resume, a copy of your transcripts. Uh, once you hit submit, we review all that, and then we select the students for phone interview. And that's really where, where it comes together. And we spend a, a good amount of time with each student going through um, what the various options are. Um, Deja, I know I did your interview, but uh, Ciara's was done by Julie. And Julie tends to, you know, I don't know, 
she, she, she falls in love with the student right away and then wants them to come. And I do too, but I'm also a little bit more uh, challenging in that I wanna make sure that the students are ready for this because sometimes uh, can can be a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a little intimidating. Um, and, and if there's a student that I feel might be triggered by large crowds or might have issues, um, I will check with their references, whether it's a professor or a job supervisor, and I'll call them and say, you know, how does this student hold up in, in these kind of situations? Because it, it can be a little bit of a pressure cooker. It's two intense weeks. Um, a lot of students don't get a full night's sleep every night. Um, and, and that impacts you. You know, you think that you're indestructible and you can go on four hours sleep every night but it catches up to you, you know, so you, you have to really kind of pace yourself because it's, it's a bit of a marathon. Isabel Ryan Kugler. My first time coming to this festival was 2009, almost 10 years ago. And um, I, was at, I, I had a film in a short film corner in an American pavilion. And it was my first time ever outside of the United States. Um, and I really fell in love with the place. I, I, would, I would look out at the water, uh, walk around and see everybody working on their films, dressed up in their tuxedos. Uh, but I actually spent a lot of time out here on the beach, you know, watching the films that were played for free. I would watch them over there, you know, I would watch them over here. Um, so it really is, you know, coming full circle for me um, to be back to be back in front of you guys with this film that means so much. Applications are now open uh, through February 16th. Uh, and there's a $400 discount if they apply and get accepted and make their payment before the end of this year. So there's a little bit of an incentive to try to get their applications in before the end of December. So applications are currently open and you said through February 16th? 17th. 17th, okay, through February 17th. So definitely take a look at that to um, find out all the information and, and get started. Um, Professor Daniel, for opportunities like this, as I um, inquired earlier again, um, for students, you know, because there's students who are watching all across the country watching this, um, where would they start? How do they start on your campus? Where would they go in terms of how it's worked at the AUC? Well, for starters, they can come see me. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, I have one of those relationships with so many students around here. Like my name really goes viral as soon as it's mentioned. And, you know, DeAsia would definitely tell you that like everyone loves me over here for some reason, I'm not sure why, but I think a lot of it just has to do with just my passion for the industry, my passion for creativity, but really my passion for young black and brown people really being successful and going after the things that they want to go after. So a large part of that is definitely coming to see me. I'm on Morehouse campus every Tuesday and Thursday evening for my five o'clock entertainment journalism course. So you can definitely come audit the class if you must. You can also email me at Christopher.Daniel at morehouse.edu and I definitely take that. Um, I'm very easy to find. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter at Journalist Historians. So students definitely hit me up there. And hopefully, like I said, you know, we can definitely do maybe some a little bit more widespread with Fulton Films and the Fulton County Government Office to really do like an open house or like an orientation of some sort. And I'm sure Michael will probably be open to that as well, but to really get this out to everybody, just let them know, like we're here, we're trying to get you there. We have a beautiful industry here, but we're global. So let's figure that out and let's make that work. Absolutely, absolutely. Any final thoughts, any last nuggets that you would like to share from Sierra? Yeah, I, I would love to say just release all of your limiting beliefs if you're even interested reach out to somebody you see here. We're all on social media, we're all around and just put in that application. It, it really is that simple as just believing in yourself and leaning on your community. You can do it. Absolutely, DeAsia? Similar to what Sierra said, um, you know, sometimes you, not, you, you just gotta just do it. Um, even if you don't think, you know, it might be night early. I'm sorry about that. Uh, even if you don't think it's the right fit for you, just do it. Uh, you never know what the outcome may be. You never know um, the networking opportunities you get out of it. It's a lot. So just do it. Michael, any last nuggets that you would like to share? You know, Deja on the videography team uh, helped our videographer, Ben Bloom, create a really nice little sizzle reel. And that's the third link there. I hope it's accessible. Um, but uh, but it's fun because it shows the students and and uh, there's a, a few of them that say some really, really nice things about 
you know, what a hustle it is and how exhausting it is, but how one of a kind it is. Um, you know, like I said earlier, it's, it's not for everyone, not but for a white student, it can really open a, a lot of doors. Um, what else can I share? Oh, uh, just, you know, CRISPR Daniel was amazing with our students this year. And, and I think one of the things I also love is seeing how professors are able to advance their own careers and, and, and make this experience work for them. Um, I worked for a while with a professor at uh, University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, and another one at San Francisco State, uh, Rachel Ramist and Cheryl Dunier, and I reached out to both of them recently, and they're no longer teaching because they're now both directing Queen Sugar for Ava and Oprah. And, you know, I love hearing stories like that, that these professors are able to leverage the access that they're getting at can making connections, finding opportunities. I wish I could say the American Pavilion helped Cheryl and, and, and Rachel, you know, land these gigs with Ava and Oprah, but I'm sure that, you know, the can experience um, is, is part of all that because it, it really is a unique, unique experience. Um, and any final nuggets from you, Professor Daniel? Yes, so because of CAN and just the opportunity to go, I was recently named an Alex Trebek Fellow through the Television Academy Foundation. So there's going to be a media educators conference the last week of October. So I'll be in Los Angeles for four days, you know, going back and forth with the Television Academy personnel and, you know, interacting with a lot of showrunners and executive producers, studio heads, executives, et cetera, to really figure out better bridges between the university systems and with the major studios in the television industry. And a lot and a large part of that was definitely due to just my time at can and my relationship with the american pavilion and really just making sure like these guys have a seat at the table so i definitely can attest to the fact that it's a beautiful program it's very beneficial and it definitely does advance your career anything that you want is out here for you and i can definitely say between all of us on this call we all really got out here and got the bag so can was definitely good to me and it was good to you guys. So thank you everybody for the opportunity and for the experience. Well, thank you all so very much for joining us. We hope that you were able to gain some vital information and insight from our CAN student experience. And we want to thank our panelists. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Enjoy the rest of your festival. Mm -hmm.